We have raised a generation that can watch Big Brother Nigeria and even run commentary online. Born again five years, they've never read their Bible cover to cover. But they have Netflix subscription. They have Z World. They are on social media. They are everywhere. No hunger for the world. Immorality is like a god in this generation. And I came to tell you the reason. The Lord is looking for Moses. He no longer can find. Men are afraid. If I give my life to the Lord, will my life not waste? Bro, I will prefer to waste here. And then when we'll awake to the Lord's trumpet, I want to awake to a reward. The Bible says in the book of Acts, I think it's 13, 36. The Bible says that it was Paul that was speaking. Paul now gave us insight. He said, David, after he had served the will of God in his generation, what happened to him? He fell asleep. You know why Paul said fell asleep? Because he knows that death is not the end. Death is just the beginning. He said he fell asleep. Because every man that sleeps will awaken. I ask you, when you sleep, what will you awaken to? A reward or a rebuke? When you, ask, when you fall asleep, how will you awaken? To a reward or to a rebuke? He said, after he had served the will of God. A translation says, after he had done the purposes of God in his generation, he died. Bro, I don't know how many years you have left in Unica. <laughs> but if God... He got to a point, God even told Moses, he said, forget them, I will kill them. And I will start a new generation with you. Moses said, fight be from thee. It is not in your character. He live an Akati. One man was the defense for the generation. One man. Look at how plenty we are in Nigeria. Christians everywhere. Even Christians in the National Assembly. Christians everywhere. But the same stealing that the unbelievers are stealing there, they are stealing. Not one of them stood up and said, like in an economy like this, we should not be giving ourselves 160 million cars. They've taken it. Because to them, that's success. Even you sitting here now, you don't celebrate men that are unknown, unloved. You don't. A thief can come here with a car now. And then the young people will say, Kai. Say, money good. We don't, even, we don't care whether it's a thief. Some of us, our parents are not our role models. Your hardworking father. That has been through hell and high water. To give you a, a, an, an education. They are not our role models. They are thieves somewhere that you are looking at and thinking that that's what life is. Some of us, our parents have been married 40 years. You've never seen your father hit your mother. Never seen your mother talk back to your father. But when you want marriage advice and how to do courtship, you go and look for preachers on, on, on social media that don't have sense. Because you, you, you look at your parents and because they don't, they don't, they don't look flashy. They don't, they don't look like, like they have anything. It's some foolish people on social media that are, that are advising you concerning your relationship. And you, you want to just come to church and say, Lord, use me. He does not use men anyhow. God is not under pressure to use men. That's what I came to tell you. He's not under pressure. When he finds a man that matches his criteria, what he can do with that man. My brother, generations will tell these stories for long. I want to be that kind of man. I have told Jesus that when I die, I don't want long eulogies told at my burial. I want when men weep that the only thing on their lips will be he was a man of God. I don't want long stories. I don't want long stories. Which generation can testify and say, we are glad 
that we pass through school with this brother. I remember, you know, me, me, me when I went to university, my father abandoned us, so I grew up in situations that were very strange. Even though my mother was an intense prayer warrior, a woman of God, a pastor in a denomination, I had strange appetites. So immediately I entered university, I joined the confraternity. And I grew in that confraternity to become the number six man of that confraternity. Oh my. During the day when you saw me, you will never be able to tell that I was, I was rugged. Within the confraternity circles, I was feared. Because you see me, when I do things, I do it with all my heart. All my heart. I was feared. That's why they even gave me the number six position because my position was to go and collect dues. So when they see me coming to their door, people used to jump through the window because I had no mercy. I was ruthless. 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 So in fellowship, nobody knew that I was that kind of guy. One day, a preacher began to preach, whether by hook or by crook, because later I found out that that preacher had derailed from God long ago, was sleeping with sisters in school. But you see, when it is the day of your salvation, God can even use a cockroach to bring you salvation. Just like he used the donkey to prevent the angel from killing Balaam. He had to open the mouth of the donkey. That brother was speaking and he got to a point in the meeting and he said, there are people in confraternities that God wants to deliver. And he said, I see the blue and the black color. And one of those ones implicated me. Where I was, I just felt heat. So I stepped out that day. And some sisters in school, in fellowship, began to cry. They could not believe. This boy, no now. They could not believe. <laughs> but when I began with Jesus, when I began, they made me final year brethren fellowship chairman. So I was to lead the final year brethren for one year. During one of the meetings, I had finished leading prayer. And there was a long queue to see me. Me! <laughs> Ole Kumana. A long queue. And then one of the sisters walked up to me. Her voice choked with tears. And she whispered in my ear. She said, you are the shockest human being I've ever seen. People thought nothing good would come out of this life. See, but I vowed, take my life, use it for your glory. Tonight is a recruitment service. It's a recruitment service. I came to call wasting men, wasting women that are ready to say, take my life, waste it. my life to write the story of a generation. Let men who pass through University of Calabar be saved because of my obedience. I don't want to miss any opportunity. If anybody meets me, they must meet Jesus. Lord, I'm ready to bear the burden of a generation. Waste my life. Spend it. Do with it what pleases you. Do with it what pleases you. My brother, when you begin to live like that, you will love prayer more than life. Hunger for the word will consume you. Because you begin to realize that outside of that ecosystem, there's not much you can become. Not much you can become. I've seen people with great degrees, they died as non-entities. But I've seen men who put their life in the hand of God, and even though the world did not call them a success, when they died, their generation celebrated them. 
Let me share a story of one of the fathers that I like to share. You know, most of the time I go back and I ask myself, this generation more educated, more technologically advanced, but yet we don't have the stories of men that lived in our nation before us. You would have heard the story many times of Archbishop Benson Idaosa. A woman's child was playing on a story building, fell down, the head burst open, brain everywhere. You know what the woman did? She carried the child, put him at the back of a pickup truck, and drove straight to Idaosa's house. And then she began to cry, Papa, oh Papa, come! And then Papa came out of his house. I watched the testimony live, the woman was the one testifying. of his house Archbishop Benson also himself said that when he saw the child his faith, all his faith died that the head was like a basket of tomatoes no faith and he was just about to turn to look at the woman to give her a salmon the Lord given the Lord taken blessed be the name of the Lord but not that kind of woman a woman that knows God knows that the Lord can bring a man out by a prophet and he can establish him by a prophet. She looked at him and said, Papa, tell Kevin may stand up, they follow me, go house. He also said, when he heard the woman, faith rose in his bed. He said, okay, Kevin, your mama said, may you get up, may you follow and they go house. The child checked to life. Checked to life. You know, every time I listen to that testimony, I ask myself, what did Adausa know? He knew God. Let us not become the lost generation. The Bible says when Joshua died, the elders died. A generation grew up. That's what arose in the King James means. They grew up that did not know God. When I begin to teach tomorrow, I'll begin to show you consequences. They grew up. They did not know God. Bro, do you know God? It's not enough to sing his songs. Do you know his heart? It's not enough to attend services in church. Do you know him in your secret place? Do you know God? Paul said, I know whom I have believed. I know him. Jesus was praying. He said, Lord, this is eternal life that they might know you the one true God and Jesus Christ your servant whom you have sent that's eternal life Christianity is not the joining of a denomination Christianity is not becoming part of an organization Christianity is making contact with life it's intimacy and when you read the Bible, dear brother, dear sister, you will see four metaphors that are used to describe our knowing of God. As sons, we know God as father. As wives, we know God as husband. As sheep, we know God as shepherd. As servants, we know God as king. These are four dimensions of knowing in the Bible. So when the Bible wants to use a metaphor to describe the Christian life, he calls us sons. When he wants to describe the relationship between himself and Israel, he says, I am your husband. Indicative of the fact that your relationship with God is supposed to be intimate as a wife is intimate with her husband. And Adam knew his wife Eve. Knew his wife Eve. Knew his wife Eve. That knowing goes beyond theological dimensions. That is experiential. It's a knowing when nothing is hidden, nothing is covered. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. It's a knowing. Where you operate from the bedchamber of God. He says in John, my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep, the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. There's a level of relationship that is sheep shepherd. If you are a sheep, how come you are still confused? You are till now, you don't know how to discern the voice of God. I don't know when it's God speaking. I don't know when it's my mind. 
As servants, we know him as king. As servants, we know him as king. That's what you call consecration. I will deal with that tomorrow. When you live for Jesus, you consecrate your life to him. Such that if he wants to, wants to throw you into the bush, you say, yes, sir. Wherever he sends you, you go. You can graduate with first class, my brother. And the Lord says, put the certificate in the box. For the next 15 years, you'll be laboring in Sokoto. Nobody will know your name. Nobody will hear of your exploits. You'll be raising the dead there. But God will make sure it never makes news. You will not be popular. You will be black. The sun will finish you. Hunger will, will teach you the way of fasting. When you come out, you will come out as an old prophet. From whose life the Lord can gain prophets.